I think we should remember that meat consumption is going up, not down. Uh, meat consumption continues to rise all over the world, not just in the United States, but in China and India, Brazil and Mexico and all the places where it's going to matter the most, meat consumption is going up. And so we have to do something. Plant-based meat is a great alternative to, to meat, but many people want what they perceive as the so-called real thing, uh, which is actual meat from animal flesh. And for those people, I think that clean meat can in the future be part of the solution. Hey everyone, welcome back to Creating a Vegan World Documentary. My name is Andrew Alexander, and in this next interview, I'm speaking with Paul Shapiro, author of Clean Meat and CEO of The Better Meat Company, where he helps talk about the cellular-based agriculture industry, where a lot of your friends who say, I'll never give up meat, there's a way to do so without harming animals. So check out this interview and subscribe to the channel to be notified of the documentary updates. A lot of people, I guess, they're not really wanting to switch to plant-based alternatives like Beyond Burger or other things where a lot of people, they might not go vegan because they don't want to give up their meat, their chicken, their beef and everything. So I guess the cellular-based agriculture industry is there to solve that. So that's kind of anything I want to talk about. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, many of the people who purchase those products, though, like Beyond and Impossible, are also meat eaters, right? And so they're quite happy to eat a Beyond burger every once in a while, but most of the time they're still eating meat. And I think we should remember that meat consumption is going up, not down. Uh, meat consumption continues to rise all over the world, not just in the United States, but in China and India, Brazil and Mexico and all the places where it's going to matter the most, meat consumption is going up. And so we have to do something. Plant-based meat is a great alternative to, to meat, but many people want what they perceive as the so-called real thing, uh, which is actual meat from animal flesh. And for those people, I think that clean meat can in the future be part of the solution. So it's not that I view it as the only solution. I, I kind of view it like with renewable energy. So if you think about f like fossil fuels, the problem of fossil fuels is so dramatic, it's so severe that you want lots of alternatives. You don't want just solar, you don't want just wind, you don't want just geothermal, you want many different options. And similarly, the problem with factory farms is also so severe that you want lots of options, plant-based meat, clean meat, hybrid, microbial proteins, and more. I think uh, the first part is, I guess, introduce what clean meat is, kind of the detailed level, then we'll transition to what problems it's solving, not only from the health aspect, but for, I guess, antibiotic resistance and bacteria, if that, I said that word right, as well as the environmental impact. So I guess introduce how is clean meat produced and does it look and feel just like the typical products? Sure. So clean meat, which is sometimes also referred to as cultivated meat, is not an alternative to meat. It is not a substitute for meat. It is real, actual animal meat that is simply grown from animal cells rather than from animal slaughter. And so basically what you can do is to take a tiny little sesame seed sized biopsy and outside of the animal's body in a cultivator, you can grow those cells to do exactly what they would do inside of the animal's body. It doesn't require genetic modification. It doesn't require anything other than giving the cells the conditions in which they believe that they're still in the animal's body and they do exactly what they would do, which is grow into the muscle that people eat today. So this would of course be a huge benefit for animals because you can produce meat without having to subject the animals to being tormented and slaughtered. It's a big benefit for the earth because it requires far less land, far less water, far fewer greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, to produce this kind of meat than the kind of meat that we produce today. But to your point, Andrew, it also would be a big benefit for reducing the use of antibiotics because right now, the, most, uh, the biggest amount of antibiotics that are being used are being fed to farm animals to keep them thriving in these inhumane and unsanitary and overcrowded and stressful conditions in which they currently are forced to live. And so when you don't have animals being overcrowded in these uh, tight conditions, 
you know, you don't have to pump everything full of antibiotics. In fact, the first clean meat now is being sold in Singapore by a company called Eat Just. They don't use any antibiotics at all to produce the meat that they are making. So one of the biggest problems that humanity is facing right now is the very real risk of antibiotic resistance, which is primarily caused to the overuse of antibiotics. Yes, overuse among humans, but really a lot of use among farm animals too. And so for antibiotic resistance prevention, switching away from a system that relies on raising and slaughtering billions of animals for food would be a great thing. So when it comes to the objections people have might eating clean meat. So when I first heard about this is a couple years ago where I would tell myself if something is grown in a lab, is it safe to eat? And I guess there's two arguments for it. There's one side is there's the answer you'll probably give, but on the other side is in comparison to what you just described, the slaughterhouses, tens of thousands of animals packed together, like bird flu strains and all the other things that could go wrong with the traditional industry, um, people still might have the objection to eating clean meat. So what yeah. type of answers do you have for that? Well, just think about how meat is produced today, Andrew. Just take chickens as one example. Right now, nearly all the chickens who are consumed by humanity are the products of genetic selection. They've been genetically selected to grow so big, so fast, that many of them have difficulty even taking more than a few steps before they collapse underneath their own unnatural bulk. Many of them are pumped full of antibiotics. They live wing to wing in their own feces. They never see the sun ever until they're on the back of a slaughterhouse bound truck. And what happens after that? Most people really would rather not hear about it. So when you consider just how inhumane and unsustainable and unnatural our current methods of meat production are, queen meat seems like the naturally preferable option. Now, I'll put it to you this way also, which is that most people today don't eat meat because of how it was produced. Most people don't eat meat thinking, oh, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. They're eating meat in spite of that fact. And so when there is a healthy, safe alternative that is the same product, but does not have the same kind of problems associated with it in terms of how it's produced, I think a lot of people are gonna be pretty eager. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people will be thrilled that they can now obtain the meat that they want without having so many problems associated with its production. That's great. And I think I read somewhere where there's other ways, if you grow the meat in the labs, there's ways to make it more nutritious, more protein or anything along those lines to make it, I guess it's a superior nutritional product than traditional meat. Yeah, so you can do one of two things. You can make meat that is identical to the meat that we eat today, or you can make products that are even better. So for example, why not make products that have no cholesterol in them? Or make products that maybe instead of being packed with saturated fat are packed with omega-3 fatty acids. So you could imagine a hamburger that instead of causing heart attacks actually prevents them. Um, you can also think about entirely novel creations. So if you think, for example, Andrew, about the time after which cows were domesticated. So people are now drinking milk, or some people are, um, but before cheese was invented. So people were drinking milk, but they hadn't figured out how to make milk curdle and make cheese. In that time period, nobody had ever dreamt of Gouda or Brie or Swiss cheese, or any of the other hundreds of types of cheese that people regularly enjoy today. Um, it was a completely novel culinary experience that was made possible by the invention of this new technology of, of curdling. And similarly, when we divorce meat from animal slaughter, we can then take control over how that meat is produced. And maybe, just maybe, we will be able to produce not only foods that are mimics of what we currently have, but that are actually better and maybe even novel culinary experiences that none of us have, ex have even contemplated in the same way that before curdling, nobody contemplated the different types of cheese that people routinely eat today. Maybe there are experiences that we've never even dreamt of that are waiting just beyond the horizon of a clean meat future. It's amazing. What type of work are you doing or the industry doing to get this message out there? I just read about your book and a few articles because I've been vegan for many years and it popped up. So what cool. type of things do you to get out there? Well, thank you for reading the book, Andrew. I too am a vegan. I've been a vegan since 1993. I think it's a great thing to do. Wish more people would do it. Um, but I recognize that most humans want to eat meat and most vegans stop being vegan. And even the vegans who have dogs and cats are probably feeding them uh, meat-based foods. So 
we have to find some way to produce meat for people and for the animals who live in our homes uh, without causing so much animal suffering and environmental degradation. And so I agree with you. I agree with the implication of your question, which is that what can we do to get the word out? And the most important thing that, uh, that could happen right now is to have government funding, just in the same way that the governments of the world are funding clean energy research, government should be funding clean meat research. And this is now just starting to happen. So certain Asian governments are now funding this kind of research. In the United States, our National Science Foundation just offered a $3.5 million grant to UC Davis in California to study cultivated meat. And so that really will help to speed things along. In addition, we need more money going to the companies. So when I wrote the book, Clean Meat, which was just a couple of years ago, there are only a handful of companies trying to commercialize these products. Now, there are more than 80, more than 80. And some of them have raised nearly nothing, and some of them have raised over $100 million. And so you know, you, you really want to see more money going into the space from investors and venture capitalists to help bring this entire field closer to a day when it can actually compete on cost with animal products, um, which we're not near there yet. But uh, reading the book Clean Meat is a great thing to do. You can go online and get it anywhere you get books at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere else. But the official website for the book is just cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com. Uh, reviewing the book on Amazon is also a helpful thing to do. Uh, sending it as a gift to people, very helpful. I think it's a great introduction to the field of cellular agriculture and it helps introduce it in a way that makes it comprehensible. This isn't a tech or a science heavy book. It's a pop side book that really tells the story of the entrepreneurs, the investors, the scientists who are all racing to commercialize the world's first slaughter-free meat and why they're doing it, what their motivations are. So by helping to uh, increase consumer acceptance of this food, by doing things like social media posts, getting the book for friends and family, uh, talking to people about it, doing shows like what you're doing right now, Andrew, I think it's imperative that we continually ensure that the introduction of this type of a food is viewed as the positive development for humanity that it actually is, and that we don't let uh, the folks who would like to see this industry fail define it before it ever reaches consumers' lips in the first place. Great. You mentioned the big part about getting the money into it, where that seems to be everything. When I interviewed David Simon, the author of Meatonomics, he said, we need a big lobbying organization to help push the government in the right direction to help create a vegan world. And everything comes down to the money where before we started recording, I talked about the industry about equity crowdfunding, where I invested in vegan fine foods. I worked for equity, another vegan startup that I just told you about, where if these clean meat companies are a way to get funding from everyday consumers like myself, that would be great. So there's a platforms mm. like Kickstarter and yeah, not Kickstarter, well, cool. um, was a uh, we funder start engine Republic. And if yeah. one of these gets on there, I'm sure a lot of vegans would love to jump in and, invest from our level as well. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I'm thrilled to see like the professional investor class putting more money and attention into the space, but also everyday people like you and me, Andrew, uh, can and should invest. And if you look at some of the early companies in the space, like let's say Super Meat in Israel, they started by having a Kickstarter online where they put out a really cool video about what they were doing and they ended up raising, my recollection is hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals who wanted to see slaughter-free meat actually commercialized. And so, you know, they now have uh, professional professional investor support. But at, at the beginning, it was just from everyday people like you and me uh, who were funding them. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure I donated to their Kickstarter. So I one day, I hope that I get something in return for that. I don't know. It's something like 50 <laughs> bucks or something. But, uh, but anyway, um, you know, that if somebody's going to think about starting a company, it's actually a pretty interesting way to get that initial funding for your company. Definitely. Yeah, there's a Kickstarter for rewards and the equity crowdfunding where it's just like, early investing in the stock market where that looks really good. So two mm -hmm. more things. One is the environmental impact where you talk about it's obviously better for the animals, billions of animals are slaughtered each year where if you do this, it's the health aspects of what you talked about. But when it comes to sustainability, where we have 10 billion, 10 billion people on earth by 2050, and then how does this become more sustainable than traditional animal agriculture or is it already? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, look, we've got nearly 8 billion of us walking around the planet right now. And as you correctly point out, Andrew, that by the year 2050, we're likely to have closer to 10 billion if we don't suffer some catastrophic event between now and then. And that is completely untenable. Like The planet is not getting any bigger 
humanity's footprint on the planet is getting bigger, but the planet itself is not getting any bigger. We're not going to be forming the moon. We're not going to be forming Mars. This is the only celestial body that we have to farm for uh, our sustenance. And it's no longer any secret that producing animal protein just takes way more resources, land, water, emissions, and more than producing plant proteins. So part of the solution has got to be that we just need to eat less meat. Um, and that's great. And people are enjoying more plant-based food. That's wonderful. But meat demand is still going up, not down, as I mentioned. And so we need to also supply people with the meat that they want. And it's not just that we're going to have more people on the planet who are demanding meat. The people on the planet now who are entering the middle class in countries like China and India want more meat. The first thing that people do when they escape poverty and enter the middle class is they start eating more animal protein. And so we need to find a way that we can actually provide that for them without destroying the planet in the process. And producing meat via uh, animal cells is a way to do that far more sustainably because what the uh, third party studies show is that producing meat from animal cells rather than animal slaughter actually takes up way less land, way less water and more. So that is gonna be a key part of the solution, I think, including plant-based, including hybrids, including microbial proteins and more. But there's a lot that we have to do. And part of that has gotta be to figure out how we can sustainably feed humanity the protein that it desires, the kind of protein that it desires without destroying our, our entire home in the process. And what type of gaps are in the market right now? You mentioned there's a lot of work to do where as you're talking, I'm just brainstorming brainstorming how many different ways we could get this out there because I see this as the next big market. Whether it's innovators, entrepreneurs, or other people, what can people do at the higher level to fill whatever gaps are missing? Yeah, well, uh, there's. if you think about the world of, let's just say, meat today, just think about, uh, let's say, fast food companies, right? There's room in the world for McDonald's, for Burger King, for Wendy's, for Jack in the Box. I mean, these are all kind of the same thing, right? They're just fast food burger joints. And there's room for all of them. There's currently room in the plant-based world for Impossible Foods and for Beyond Meat, despite the fact they're both just plant-based burgers. And there's room for more. There's room for companies that haven't even been founded yet. So then you th start thinking about the world of the cellular agriculture space where nearly none of these companies have commercialized anything at all. And that means that there is a huge white space available for any entrepreneur who wants to get involved. And so if you're thinking, oh, I would really like to you know, get into the world of growing uh, fish without having to uh, kill fish from the ocean or use aquaculture. But you know, there's a company called Blue Nalu, which is already doing that. Who cares? Do it as well. You never know, it's just because there is a company that is in the weed or is the first, it doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily um, be the winner in the end, nor does it mean that they're gonna be the only company in the end, um, even if they are a winner. So uh, I would encourage you to get into the game and don't think about it as thinking, well, what do I know about this? I'm not a tissue engineer, that's fine. Look at Josh Tetrick as an example. He's the CEO and co-founder of Just, the company that just commercialized the very first ever clean meat in Singapore. And this is a guy who has no scientific background, no business background. He started this company on the suggestion of his friend. And so far they've raised a quarter of a billion dollars and have now commercialized clean meat. Um, that is truly an incredible story. If you look at a company like Perfect Day, they're uh, a company that's doing microbial protein to produce um, uh, dairy proteins uh, from, from microbes rather than from cows. This is a company where it was two guys in their early 20s who had never met in person, got introduced and had some video chats and decided decided to start this company themselves to program yeast to make dairy proteins like whey and casein. And now, six years later, they are still in their 20s. Even six years later, they've raised $300 million and they've commercialized these products. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't have the qualifications to be doing this, just recognize that many people who are successfully running very successful companies in this space uh, maybe had the same level of experience or knowledge or maybe even less than you do. And so I would encourage you to think about how you can get in the game, whether that's by starting a company, joining a company, funding a company, investing in a company, uh, promoting a company. And you can think about it in lots of ways because maybe let, let's just say you are 
um, an HR person and you're thinking, well, I don't know anything about molecular biology. I don't know anything about tissue engineering. All these companies need HR specialists as well. They all need graphic designers. They all need accountants. And so no matter what your position is, no matter what you're doing, you could probably be useful for these companies because they, just like other companies, need a whole variety of people working there, not just people who have PhDs in microbiology. So I would encourage you to get involved. Uh, the planet is burning, literally. I mean, here I am, I'm in California right now. It's December, 2020, and our state is still on fire. Still in December, we are on fire. Uh, if that doesn't tell you that we got to solve this problem urgently, I don't know what will. And so my hope is that people listening to this will contemplate what they can do to get into the game and actually make a difference, whether as an investor, as a team member, as a co-founder, or in some way to help move the uh, alternative protein movement forward and help start solving this problem of increased meat consumption that the world is facing right now. You touch on some key points there where when I first want to start a business, it's like I have to learn everything myself, where I built my first business, took a long struggle and everything. But then I joined the team with Veg Ready, where I didn't know about preserving meals to make them shelf stable for a year. I'm not a food engineer. I don't have the finance background, but the CEO, he comes with finance background. I do the internet marketing. Someone else does the website development. And I worked for equity when for the first two years being in the company. So like you said, it's like a piece of a puzzle and you don't have to be the expert at anything. And just with filming the documentary, I know nothing about the video like adjustments when you're filming. And I found a videographer, set up four cameras, did everything. I just sit back and it, sometimes it's easier to be in the back position of the company and just kind of see everything come together. So anyone who's starting, you made some real key points about that. Cool. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Look, you, the way, what you just described is like the quintessential story. You get a few people who kind of know what they're doing in different realms and put them together and see what magic you can make happen. Definitely. Is there anything else you want to talk about before you go? I know you have a, you're founded a recent company in the space or similar space. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I co-founded the Better Meat Co. in 2018. And what we do is we're a B2B ingredients company. and We sell ingredients to major food manufacturers that enable them to use fewer animals by using our innovative plant protein formulas. And so we partner up with meat companies. So for example, in Australia, we're partnered with a great company called RTC Foods that uh, has products in the market that are hybrids. So they're, they combine both animal and plant protein uh, for that meat consumer that would like to enjoy less meat, but would also wants to make sure they want, you know, getting the meat that they want to. And so we're also partnered with companies in the United States to do similar things. But in, in effect, we help major meat companies and major meat users use a lot fewer animals and to be able to use more plants. And uh, we're doing well. We've got uh, a great team of 15 people here in Sacramento, California, and we're growing. And we really feel like we're making a difference in the world to try to create a more sustainable food system. And I'm really proud of what our team here has accomplished so far in the first two and a half years of our existence. But we still have an enormity to do. And I'm reminded of that every single day. Uh, so they say that when you start a company, you will sleep like a baby, meaning that you will wake up every two hours and cry. And uh, I can assure you that is how I feel sometimes. I can definitely relate. So on that note, I won't take up too much of your day. I'm sure you got a lot to do. So thank you for taking the time to do this interview. Oh, it's my pleasure, Andrew. Thanks so much. And I'm so grateful that you read the book, Clean Meat.